Welcome to Orchard Hill. It's great to be together online this weekend. Uh, I'm in the chapel of our Wexford campus as our auditorium has begun some renovations that have long been planned. And so this is our gathering place for at least these weeks. And I'm just so glad that we get to share this time together. Let me pray and then we'll jump into what we have today. Father, we ask that as we're gathered in different places that you would meet with each of us. God, I pray that my word would reflect your word in content and in tone and in emphasis. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Certainly, we have been through a season together in this country, a season unlike any other that probably any of us have been through. And this time has brought about a lot of different reactions from different people. There are the optimists among us who say it'll all be over soon and the economy will skyrocket and it won't be as bad as you think. There have been those who have been more pessimistic who say that this is going to be worse than you think and it's only the beginning and we are headed to something that is incredibly difficult. The food supply is going to dry up, the economy is going to tank and everyone's going to be left fending for themselves. And then there are those who see this and they see conspiracy theories almost everywhere. They look around and they say, well, this is the Democrats who want to uh, kind of make it hard for the Republicans or this is the Republicans or this is some grab for power by some group or something like that. And here's what we don't know. What what we really don't know at this moment is, is this coronavirus event a blizzard? Is it the beginning of winter or is it the dawn of an ice age? And we don't really know the answer to that. And this has spawned a lot of people to ask some, some significant questions. Some people are asking the question, where is God in this? Has God abandoned his creation? Some people are asking the question, is this the judgment of God? I've had other people ask me, are these the signs of the end times, of the last days before God comes? And they're all great questions. They're not questions that are being discussed in the national media, but they are questions that thinking people of faith have. And often people who don't even ascribe to a particular faith are starting to ask and say, where is God in this moment in history. And in fact, I think you have to ask the question. I saw a story the other day about how some of the curve is starting to flatten in our country, but how in some places it's probably going to be much harder in the days ahead. And they were talking specifically about refugee camps and how people can't social distance and how once the virus gets into a place like that, that there is no good outcome. And you have to ask the question, where is God? Where is God in this pandemic? And today we're going to begin a new three-week series that we're calling, Where is God in this Pandemic? And we're going to look at the Old Testament book of Joel. Joel is a minor prophet. There are two groups of prophets in the Old Testament, the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets just simply means they're longer books, the minor prophets, shorter books. Joel is one of those shorter books. And Incidentally, I had planned this year to take us through the book of Amos a little later, which was a prophecy that often spoke to people who were comfortable. And Joel, which I've now switched to, is a book that addresses a country going through a crisis, a people going through a crisis. And I often read the scripture before we jump into the teaching, but today I'm going to read enough of this in this teaching that I didn't want to read this ahead of time. And here's what we read. It says this, the word of the Lord came to Joel, son of Pethuel. And this is a a way of just simply standardly starting a book. And then it says this, hear this, you elders. Now, elders here probably just means civic leaders. It probably doesn't mean elders of a church uh, since churches didn't exist like this. This is just saying elders of the community, civic leaders. Listen, all you who live in the land, has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. And what he simply does here is he starts out and he says, listen, all of you, I want you to ask the question, have you ever seen anything like this? Now, Joel is talking about a locust plague. We'll read about that in verse four. 
but the question is pertinent for you and me today. Have, have you seen anything like this in your lifetime? And the answer probably for most of us is no. Unless you were old enough to remember the Spanish flu in 1918, for most of us, this would be, we have not seen anything like this. This is new. And what Joel does is he says, if you are experiencing something like you've never experienced before, then this is a time to say, pay attention, see what's happening. And then he says, I want you to tell this to your children and to their children. And I think the point of this is because it's easy to get so comfortable that we forget what is ultimate reality. He's saying, when you have a moment of seeing and understanding things beyond what you typically think, he says, I want you, I want you to tell it to your children and to their children. And then we read about this plague, verse four. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. And what the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. And there's actually four different words used for locusts here. And that probably just connotes the totality of this, this uh, kind of blight to the people. And as we, we, we see this, a, a locust is, uh, is a plural word basically for grasshopper. So this is a grasshopper invasion that was so pervasive that it ate the crops that it completely devastated the land. Then we read this, verse five, wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. So here he's saying, listen, I, those of you who enjoy your drinking, enjoy your wine, know that your wine is gone. Now, I've had some people ask the question in Pennsylvania, why is a beer store an essential business and a wine store not? And, and it's almost the same thing where the, where the drinkers of wine are saying, why is this not the, the way it is? And, and what is happening here in Joel is, is Joel is saying to the people who like to party, who like their wine, who like their drinks, and yes, he calls them drunkards, but, but what he's doing in essence is he's saying, those of you who this is your lifestyle, know that it's been disrupted. And then we see this. A nation, verse six, has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It's laid waste to my vines and ruined my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Verse eight, mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the betrothed of her youth. What's happened here is her wedding is probably called off. Maybe her betrothed has lost, lost his life. Maybe it's just had to be delayed because of the locust swarm. And some of us have had weddings or celebrations that have been postponed. Maybe we've welcomed a baby during this time and we haven't been able to share the baby with friends and family. Or maybe we've, we've had an event, a birthday or a graduation or a season that's been canceled. And, and he's saying, mourn these things because your life, the things that you had enjoyed and thought were significant and are significant are being taken away. And then it says this, grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. And what he's saying here is the church, the temple in that day can't go on as it's been, been doing for so long. And then it says this, verse 10, the fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the olive oil fails. Despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers, grieve for the wheat and the barley because of the harvest, the harvest of the field is destroyed. So here he's got the farmers included. So what you get here is you get the civic leaders, you get the, the partiers, you get the brides, you get the priests, and you get the farmers, the workers. And here's what I believe is happening in this, in this text is Joel is saying this locust swarm has come. These grasshoppers have invaded. You've never seen anything like it. And this is a di disruption to every area of life. Every one of you has a life right now that is not like the life that you had a few weeks ago or expected to have today. Does that sound familiar in any way? And you see, when disruption happens, it creates a, a perspective in a certain way. Or maybe better stated, it reveals our perspective. Uh, there's an article that a man named Michael J. Kruger wrote, and he was talking about the idea of when this first came out and the people were still going to 
Florida and partying on the beaches for their spring break. And not to make too much of an analogy between the drinkers of wine and the partiers on spring break, but he was saying that, that their attitude of saying, we don't care if this virus spreads any further because we had a spring break planned and we're going to have our spring break no matter what. And he said that reveals an attitude of our age, which he said, and he has tabbed as this attitude of, he calls it, you do you. And he said, you do you has been the predominant attitude of our age. And then he says this, nothing tests the validity of a worldview like tragedy and suffering. And the coronavirus, as awful and terrible as it is, has done at least one good thing. Namely, it has exposed our culture's commitment to an utterly unworkable an unsustainable worldview. And what he's talking about here is a commitment to relativism. In other words, the coronavirus has exposed our culture's commitment to relativism for what it is, an utterly unworkable and unsustainable worldview. You see, what's happened all of a sudden is this mindset of saying, you do you, kind of the, the, the predominant view of much of our culture has been exposed because what happened was when those people continued to party, people started to say, hey, that's not, that's not cool because you're gonna impact others. There's another worldview or thought that's come for some. And that is this whole idea of saying, why don't we just let the virus run its course? And if people die, well, they die. And yet the Christian view has always been that every life matters because every life is created in the image of God and dignity exists in human beings, no matter how old or how frail. There was an op-ed piece by Russell Moore in the New York Times that, that argued for this. And he basically said that this is, is part of the perspective that we need to have. And I, I like how he concluded his article. He said, the pandemic will change us, change our economy, our culture, our priorities, our personal lives that we cannot avoid but let's remember one day we will tell our grandchildren how we lived, how we loved during the great pandemic. Let's respect human life in such a way that we will not be ashamed to tell the truth. But you see, you do you says, you know what? I, it doesn't matter how this impacts anybody. Now I'm not suggesting that there aren't thorny issues of the economy and how we reopen the economy. Th those are complex moral decisions, ethical decisions. And we need to pray for our leaders to make good ethical decisions in this point. And we should have some debates around that. But my point right now is simply to say this, and that is, what the coronavirus has done is it has exposed and disrupted our pattern of life and our mindset that says you do you is enough. And you see this even, even with the hoarding that some people are doing, where, where they're buying goods and trying to profit. I, I saw one thing where a guy had bought all kinds of hand sanitizer and was going to try to sell it at a higher price. And I think Amazon shut them down from selling it. But, but, but there's an outrage from people rightly because they say, what is this person doing? So what do we learn from, from this disruption? Well, let me suggest at least four things. First, I think we learn that our sense of control is not as solid as we think it is, that we don't have as much control as we think we do. The control is really an illusion. This is what was happening in Joel's day when the people, and we don't know the definitive historic setting of this, but that the people, when they had this, this locust invasion, all of a sudden their, their wine, their partying, their work, their farming, their marriages, their lives didn't go on the way they thought they would. And, and all of their plans came to nothing. And all of a sudden they had to say, I don't have as much control as I think I do. And many of us love the notion of controlling our future, of managing our lives in such a way that we think we have everything the way we want it to be. But what this pandemic is doing is it's showing us that we don't have as much control as we think we do. Now, here's the second thing that I think we learn. And that is that we really don't have or that our resources are not as valuable as we think they are. And I say this because all of a sudden, in the midst of this locust plague, the resources of the farmers, the resources of the coming marriage, the resources of the church or the, or, or the community of faith, the resources of the partiers, the drinkers, weren't what they thought they were. And one of the things that we learn 
when we come up against something like this is that all of the resources we have may amount to very little against something that shows us the ultimate reality. In Matthew chapter 6, we read these words. This is Jesus teaching. He says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and venom destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moss and venom do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, one of the things that happens when we're confronted with, with a pandemic and all of a sudden some of what we've, we've amassed doesn't have the same value that we thought it did whether that be homes or, or money or whatever. And, and some of us will say, well, it's better to have money than not. That's true. But, but, but what we're realizing in the midst of this is that that money can't be a hedge against anything in this world, that it isn't ultimate security, that it isn't ultimately valuable because you can be rich or poor and be in the same predicament. I was uh, spending some extra time with my family and one of the things that we do from time to time is we'll play some games. And last year when we were with my extended family, my wife's extended family, my brother-in-law or her brother-in-law, I like to say he's nothing to me because he's her sister's husband. Actually, that was his joke to me long before it was mine to him. So if you think I'm being rude, I'm just, that's for you, Uncle John. So you know that that's how I see you here today. But uh, Uncle John uh, said, you should get this game Yunta. And I'm like, Yunta, why should I get the game Yunta? So I bought the game Yunta because uh, he remembered it fondly because when we get together as an extended family, we'll play some games. So Yunta is this game that uh, we didn't actually get to play it yet, but, but I've figured out how it's supposed to be played. And the premise is all these people are on this island and the island is about to um, run out of money. And so all of these families are competing to get as much money as they can and send it to a Swiss bank account. And whoever sends the most money to the Swiss bank account through political corruption and intrigue is the winner. So it's a, kind of an awful game in a sense. But here's what it made me think of. In a sense, we're all living a game of yunta, <laughs> except here's the thing. It's not about how much you can stab somebody in the back and get money in a Swiss bank account, but it's about saying, I can send money out of the game to a secure place where it can never be touched and it's waiting for me. That's what Matthew 6, 19 through 21 is saying, that you can send treasure ahead. And one of the things that, that happens when we're in the midst of something like this is we realize that all of the acquisition that we can get in this world may provide a more comfortable existence, but we can't take it with us. I'm so thankful so many of you who call Orchard Hill your church home have given so generously in this time. And many of you have, have given to the Elios Fund. It's just a way to say, I want to share with people. Do you know what you're doing every time you do either of those things is you're saying, I'm sending treasure ahead. It isn't about just my resources. So we, we learn in the midst of this that in one way or another, we don't have as much control as we think we do. We learn that our resources aren't as valuable as we think they are. And then I would say, we learn that our pleasures aren't as lasting as we, as we think they are. If I were to ask you, what is your pleasure in life? It would be easy to hear just talk about the, the drunkards and the partiers that, that are mentioned here. But, but notice again, there's the young lady who's getting married. So it's family, it's social relationship. There's the farmer who works. There's the priest who, who uh, serves in the temple. In other words, this covers the gamut. There's the civic leader, the elder. So, so it's saying wherever you find your value, whatever you find is your, your pleasure, partying, serving, um, family, resources, work. He says, whatever that is, something can come and take that away. In other words, our pleasures are not as lasting as we like to think they are. Richard Foster wrote this once years ago. He said, superficiality is the crisis of our age. The doctrine of instant satisf satisfaction is a primary spiritual problem. The desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. And one of the things that happens when we come face to face with this, this crisis is we realize that our pleasures are not as lasting as we like to think they are. You know, in American Christianity, often what it seems like Christianity is about is getting your best life now, 
getting God to help you to have a happy family, to have success, to have money, to have quality time, whatever it is you think you value. Well, I came across something the other day that just struck me. This is from the Book of Common Prayer for the Church of England. And it's an order for visitation of the sick. And this is from a few generations ago. So this is not their current one. But I, but I want you to just imagine that you're sick and that a pastor or a friend, a leader of your small group comes to the hospital to visit you and they go over this prayer service with you J- just for a moment, okay? J- just see if this, th- this, this makes you go, yeah, that's, that's what I would expect or if it's something different. Yeah, this is Church of England a couple generations ago. This isn't that long ago. Wherefore, whosoever or whatsoever your sickness is, know you certainly that it is God's visitation and for what causes, what cause soever this sickness was sent unto you. And then it gives us some causes. Whether it be to try you and your patience, whether it be for the example of others, whether it be for your faith that it may be found laudable, glorious, and honorable to the increase of glory and endless felicity, or else it be sent unto you to be corrected and amend in you, to correct and amend in you whatsoever does offend the eyes of your heavenly father. Know you certainly that if you truly repent of your sins and bear your sickness patiently, trusting in God's mercy for his dear son, Jesus Christ's sake, and to render unto him humble thanks for his visitation, submitting yourself wholly unto the will, unto his will, it shall turn to your profit and help you forward into the right way that leads to everlasting life. And then you're encouraged to end with an amen. Now, the reason I read that is, can you imagine if you're sick and one of our Life Stage Pastors Care Ministry team comes and visits you and says, let me pray that over you. You would say, I want somebody from a different church. (laughs) <laughs> because what you want is you want somebody to go, oh, let's pray for healing. Let's pray for comfort. Let's make this feel better. But, but notice that, that a generation ago said, here is what you should pray when you're sick. And it's understand God's visitation is here to bring about some kind of a change in your life. You see, when you ask the question, where is God in a pandemic? Part of the answer is that he is visiting you and me to help us realize that we don't have as much control as we think, that our resources aren't as valuable as we think, and that our pleasures aren't as lasting as we think. Now, you may say, well, does God then send this? Well, in the Bible, the answer to does God send a crisis is actually twofold. That is yes and no. Now, I realize some of my friends who are more deterministic, Calvinistic would say, well, God ultimately sends everything. And I would agree with that. But biblically, you can make a case for either answer. In the book of Joel, God seems to send the locusts. In fact, that's the implication in Joel chapter two, when he says, repent and see if I may not yet turn and, and, and change and relent from sending this. But in the book of Job, when Job goes through a crisis, It's clearly not God who sent it, it was Satan and God allowed it. But either way, God allows something to come. And what we see in Joel is that God wants to use it to rest our attention. And that leads me to the fourth kind of observation or fourth thing that we see. And that is our situation is not as bleak as we think it is. And the reason I say this is because Joel chapter one, verse 13 and following says this, put on sackcloth, you priests, And mourn and wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God, for the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders, again, civic leaders, and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. So he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to call people together and call out to God, mourn basically, and call out to God so that you would have a sense that God can be active in this. Now, if you've followed any kind of um, teaching on this in the broader Christian community, there are different people who will say a lot of things. Here are the basic messages that that I've seen from pastors nationally. Some are, are focusing on quelling your anxiety and kind of trying to help you navigate fear. And and that's helpful. Um, I'm not sure it answers the entire question, but it's helpful. 
But there are those, and this would be more in the charismatic Pentecostal group, who will say things like, all you need to do is declare that the coronavirus has no power over your house, and then you will be delivered from this. But what that misses is the possibility that God is using it to call people to himself. In fact, I saw one of the well-known charismatic churches, the one that spawns a bunch of music that people like, and it has a healing room that's infamous, but they closed it due to the coronavirus. And I just thought that tells you everything you need to know about a healing room if it has to be closed because of the coronavirus. And, and I'm not trying to pick on that other than to say this, what we need to do is not bind the coronavirus, not just manage our anxiety, but we need to say, where is God in this? And where God is in this is he's saying to people, I want you in the midst of your disruption to come back to me, to cry out to me. That, that's what he's saying here. And here's what, what we see in Joel chapter uh, 1, verse 14, 15. It says this, it says, Declare a holy fast again, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. And then it says this, Alas for that day, for the Lord, the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. And he says, the day of the Lord is near, is near. Now, what's the day of the Lord? Well, notice here that it is a day for destruction. In one Old Testament dictionary, uh, an article written by J.D. Barker says this, the day of the Lord is a significant recurring theme in the prophetic literature of the Old Testament. At its essence, it refers to a time of Yahweh's unmistakable and powerful intervention. The prophets employ both the specter of the day of the Lord to offer both a warning and a hope, announcing disaster and salvation. In other words, without taking you through all the texts that use the word day of the Lord, and that would be a fascinating thing to do in your life group is just to look at all of the implications. It's used both to say, this is a day of judgment for those who don't believe and a day of salvation. In other words, this is a way in which God says, I am going to work in the days ahead. And the reason I say that it's not as hopeless as, as we think is because even if this day, alas, the day that, that we're in, the day where people are crying out for the day of the Lord is near, is we can call out to God and we can be on the side of salvation. And to cry out to God is a little Hebrew verb, zakar, and it, and it means something very similar to the New Testament idea of call on the name of the Lord. In other words, when the New Testament says, call on the name of the Lord and you may be saved, to, to cry out to the Lord, cry out to God was very similar. It meant to wail, to, to mourn, to summon for help in desperation. And so that's what this is. And what Joel does is chapter one says, here's a locust plague. Chapter two says, says there's, this is pointing to something more. And then chapter three takes us to the ultimate day of the Lord. And what chapter one does is it says, whenever you find your life disrupted, whenever you find yourself in a place where you say, this hasn't happened before, this is unique, let it be an occasion to turn to the Lord, to cry to the Lord. To say, God, I need your help because I don't have the control that I thought I had. My resources won't help me as much as I thought they would. My pleasures aren't as strong or as lasting as I thought they would be. I saw a thing a while back about a tsunami. And I guess when a tsunami comes, there are a couple different indicators. But one thing that can happen is the water can actually recede from its normal shoreline substantially. Um, you know, several minutes before the actual wave appears. And there's one video I saw where people uh, were experiencing this phenomenon and were so taken in by it, they were all going, wow, this is amazing. And then all of a sudden the, the wave comes. And what should happen when, when the tsunami is about to hit is you should actually run. So, so when the water goes out, you should say, this is a bad sign and run because soon a wave is coming. The locust plague, Joel says, is like that. Alas for that day, the day of the Lord is near, the day of destruction. He's saying, it's coming, be ready. You know it's coming. So now do something about it. And what he says to do is to cry out. Now, you may say, well, doesn't he say that the priest should call a solemn assembly, call all the elders together? That's absolutely what he says. And that's good. 
But do you know that the Old Testament priest does not have an analogy in the New Testament? And here's what I mean. In the Old Testament, a priest was one who represented God to people and people to God. In the New Testament, we're told in 1 Peter 2 that there is a kingdom of priests. In other words, anyone who believes in Jesus is a priest. And here's why that's important. The, 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 the implication of Joel chapter one is not pastors should call a solemn assembly. That's a good thing. I'm not saying that you can't do that and call people together. Right now in our moment of social distancing, that doesn't seem like, like it's the thing to do to say, call everyone to the church and let's have a solemn assembly. But, but that could be a response to a disruption, a disaster. But, but the reason I, I point this out is because the idea of a solemn assembly and a priest is saying everyone who is a priest, which if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a priest, it's saying use this event to call people to Jesus. In fact, just listen to these verbs that, that are here. Hear this. Listen. Verse one or verse two, excuse me. In other words, pay attention. Verse five, wake up. And then it says this, lament or mourn, verse eight, verse 13. And then it's cry out or call on the name of the Lord. And so here's just simply the message today about where is God in a pandemic? And that is he's maybe allowing this to say, I want you to see that there is a day of the Lord coming and that day will be destruction for those who don't believe. So call on the name of the Lord. And maybe, just maybe today, wherever you are, you can say, I want to cry out to the Lord. I want to mourn. I want to see, be a person who sees and doesn't just see this as a, as a, as a momentary disruption to my partying, my work, my marriage, my family plans, but as something bigger. But also to say, in essence, I, I want to cry out in a way that reflects the sackcloth in this morning as a priest, a representative of God and call others to the same thing. Now, how do you do that? Well, it's going to be different for everybody. But I think at a minimum, it means that you would say, if I have never come to Jesus, this is a moment to come to Jesus. And you know, it's possible some of you have grown up in church, maybe this church, and you're sitting around with your parents and, and you've never really bought the whole religion thing because it felt like it crimped your style. And maybe God is using this to say, your job that you thought you had lined up, your income, your marriage, your parties, your stuff, I'm taking it all away so you're forced right now to deal with something more. And maybe this is your time to say, I believe that Jesus came and died for me, that the day of the Lord is coming and I want to be sheltered by Jesus himself. And that is, is the, the clear teaching of, of the New Testament. And, and if you think about just the moment we're in, if somebody said, I have a universal antidote to this virus and it can be available to everyone and it's free, that would be such good news. That is the message of the gospel. Our virus is sin and Jesus has the anecdote. He has paid the price. It's available. Cry out to the Lord. And maybe for some of you, it's, just to say, I'm going to cry out to the Lord on behalf of my nation, people around me. You know, there's two great prayers. There's more than that, but two that I want to just recommend in the Old Testament. In Nehemiah 9 and in Daniel 9, there are prayers of confession from the people. Maybe, maybe if you're watching with some family and friends, you just want to say, hey, let's, let, let's be our own priest today. And let me take a moment and pray one of those prayers of confession for us together as just a way to say, we're going to cry out to the Lord in the midst of this moment. And what we'll see next week when we talk about Joel chapter two is that there's this beautiful language where Joel says, if you return to the Lord, who knows? He might still relent. And then there's this beautiful promise about God restoring the years that the locusts have eaten away. And we'll examine that next week. But I, I, I want to just just very simply say today that, that what Joel 1 urges is for us not to just put blinders on in the midst of this, but to cry out to the Lord in the midst of our mourning, in the midst of our sadness. And I hope you'll do that wherever you are and however God's working in and through this time in your life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for just the chance to be together via this medium, although it's not the same as being together in person. 
We thank you that, that at least this is available to us today. And God, we pray that in the midst of this pandemic, we wouldn't amuse ourselves and our time away, but instead we would let the gravity of this point us to the gravity of the day of the Lord, your day, and that we would cry out to you as this text so beautifully invites us to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.